Tragedy north of the city before the start of the school day. A child struck and killed by a school bus in Vaughan. The driver remaining on scene. Good afternoon. A neighborhood in Kleinburg has been left shaken after a six-year-old boy was struck and killed. It happened this morning around 8 a.m. while other children were on the bus at the time. CTV's Raheem Ladani is at the scene in Kleinburg, which is in Vaughan, to bring us the latest. Raheem. Michelle and Nathan, good afternoon. The mood in this neighborhood right now is extremely heavy. And speaking with neighbors, this is a very family-oriented neighborhood. People have been coming up, taking a look at the scene, and sharing with us that this very easily could have been one of their children or grandchildren. And now police are working to piece together how this tragedy happened. A yellow school bus that's parked on the side of the road, a block away from where its driver struck a young boy in this residential neighborhood. I heard the school driver when immediately happened, she was trying to do CPR on the child. I looked over and um, I, saw, I saw the scene and it's horrible. It was just before 8 a.m. when police say they were called to the intersection of Kleinberg Summit Way and Pierre Burton Boulevard. When officers arrived, they found a six-year-old boy. The six-year-old boy uh, suffered fatal injuries and unfortunately was pronounced on the scene. We are working hard right now with our partners to continue the investigation. We have victim services and uh, peer support that are available for officers, parents, teachers, children that may be affected by this. Other kids were on the bus at the time of the crash. While neighbors add this is a busy area with many children walking to their bus stop every morning. Police say the driver of the bus is cooperating, but that it's too early to know if speed was a factor in the accident or if the young boy was hit by his own school bus. Truthfully, this Kleinberg Summit Way, uh, cars are ripping up and down here. Um, uh, and it's, they're, they're coming pretty fast here. Vaughn Mayor Stephen Del Duca shared his condolences on social media, writing in part, there are no words that can adequately express our sympathy and condolences to the family, friends and classmates of this child as they grieve this unthinkable loss. Police are asking any neighbors with surveillance video to come forward. This stretch of roadway is going to remain closed for several more hours, and so police are asking anyone that plans to pass by here to find an alternate route. Also, the media officer who we spoke with said it is too early in the investigation to say if any charges will be laid. Reporting live, I'm Raheem Ladani. I'll send it back to you both in studio. Thank you, Raheem. To another incident on our roads, a fiery crash on the 401 overnight is causing heavy traffic. It closed down express lanes from the DVP to Leslie, resulting in a major headache for many drivers during the morning rush hour. Let's go to CTV's John Musselman live in North York with all the details on this one. John. Hi, right, Nathan. I'm on Bayview just north of the 401 in behind me. Traffic is still moving slowly. There's still some closures. We'll just let you know that the truck driver in this crash did survive, but it was a spectacular crash with a lot of fire. Flames lit up the early morning sky following a devastating crash. A tractor trailer heading east on the 401 collided with a concrete barrier. It happened around 3 a.m. near Bayview Avenue. This video from an MTO camera shows flames and thick smoke coming from the wreckage. Uh, what we have information is there's no other vehicles involved. And the vehicle caught on fire. Driver was able to get out of the vehicle. He was taken to hospital with some minor injuries. The highway has been closed since about 3 o'clock this morning, and we're hoping to get it open by noon. The crash and eventual cleanup has caused major traffic delays in the area. Investigators say the truck was carrying a load of meat. Westbound express lanes have been closed from the Don Valley to Leslie Street. The HOV tunnel from the southbound 404 to westbound 401 is also closed. They're still cleaning up the highways. When you have a large fire like that, you really need to make sure that the highway is safe for people to travel on afterwards. The cause of the crash remains under investigation. Motorists are being urged to avoid this area if possible. Now we'll just give you a live shot from the CTV helicopter over the scene. The information we are getting from police says that the express lanes are starting to reopen. The right lane remains blocked west of Leslie at the collision site. We're also hearing that the transfers from the collector to the express lanes remain closed. So this is a very uh, complicated cleanup. Once they get that done, they'll hope to have everything reopened later in the day. Reporting live, I'm John Muslim. I'll send it back to you. Good to know. Thank you, John. Toronto police have identified the man killed at a hit and run in the West End. Earlier this month, police say 48-year-old Stuart Costigan was in the area of Roncesvalles Avenue and Dundas Street West 
at around 5.15 a.m. June 6th. They say he was struck by a dark-colored Volkswagen GTI and did not survive. Investigators say they believe they have located the suspect vehicle. They're now hoping to hear from members of the public who may have been in the area at the time of the crash so they can positively identify a suspect. Anyone with information is asked to contact traffic services. And fire crews responded to a two-alarm blaze at a commercial building in Scarborough overnight. Flames broke out at a single-story building on Progress right across from the Scarborough Town Center. The fire has since been extinguished and an investigation into the cause is underway. There are no reports of any injuries. Still ahead, the Edmonton Oilers force a game six in their Stanley Cup final, downing the Florida Panthers to shift this series back to Edmonton Friday. We'll have game highlights and look ahead a little bit later in the show. But first, a look outside. We are into another day where there is a heat warning because this heat wave continues. Mainly overcast skies this hour, hoping for a bit more sunshine. But it's another day where you really need to be cognizant of the heat and the humidity. Jessica Smith is here with a look at the current conditions. What do we need to know today, Jess? Another very high UV index day, Michelle. So even if we don't have that brilliant sunshine, it doesn't mean that we aren't still really feeling the effects of the sun. So sun protection, a hat, long sleeves, maybe if you work outside still really important. We are still in that heat warning criteria through southwestern Ontario in and around central Ontario and northern Ontario and that is not changing as we head throughout the day today. That big ridge in the jet stream still there. Areas to northern Alberta for example this morning we're sitting around the freezing mark. We were in the 20s already here in the city of Toronto and across most of the GTA and the heat continues to build. We don't really see things start to return to a somewhat normal level until we head in towards the end of the weekend. Temperature wise, we're sitting at 27. It feels like 36 and it is only getting hotter. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your long range forecast right now. I'll send it back to Michelle and Nathan. Thank you, Jess. And as this heat persists, some of the most at risk of suffering from health effects as a result are our city's most vulnerable. Two people recently died in the Moss Park area from drug poisoning, and community organizations say drug users are more susceptible to the heat. CTV's Janice Golding is live and has more details on all the concerns. Janice. Hi, Nathan. It is certainly muggy out here, and as the heat alert continues, advocates are saying we need to pay more attention to the city's most vulnerable if we want to prevent deaths. The workers at All Saints Church Community Center say yesterday two people died at Moss Park due to drug poisoning, and a third person was taken to the ER. Beyond what they're calling a particularly poisonous supply in the area, they say people who use drugs are at heightened risk for heat-related illnesses because they may not be aware they're dehydrated or that they need to seek shelter. As a result, the community center got the local councillor to get the city to deploy one of its two HTO to go water trailers to Moss Park yesterday, and it will be back this afternoon. Eat. Uh, if you're using opioids, for example, um, you're not thinking about your, your thirst, essentially. You're not thinking about your health and welfare. Um, you may be on the nod, and so you may not be drinking what you need, and you can dehydrate very quickly. For people who use stimulants, you often don't notice that you're thirsty at all. Um, so we do see people who get heat stroke, um, who can pass out, even if they're not using opioids, but rather stimulants. So it's a huge concern for us. Now, Diana Chan McNally says her team has also been handing out water bottles. And as I mentioned, the city's water truck will be coming back to Moss Park this afternoon. However, McNally says that we need a more permanent hydration strategy to serve the people that she helps. Reporting live from Janice Golding, now back to Michelle and Nathan. Thank you, Janice. York Regional Police have made a pair of arrests after a woman was fatally shot outside Vaughn Mills Shopping Center. Police have identified the victim as 21-year-old Alicia Goler Kotler from Hamilton. She was shot in the mall's parking lot yesterday evening and died of her injuries in hospital. A 23-year-old man from Brampton has been charged with first-degree murder and a 22-year-old man charged with accessory after the fact. The relationship between the two accused and the victim uh, are not known at this time, but we do believe that they are known to each other. We do believe that this uh, incident is targeted and there's no threat to public safety. There are no outstanding suspects or vehicles. We do encourage those who may have dash cam footage from the parking lot of Vaughn Mills and anyone who may have seen anything to please reach out to our homicide unit. This investigation is still very much in the early stages. We'll have more details on the story later on CTV News at 5 and 6. A bid by the University of Toronto to clear the downtown pro-Palestinian encampment is being heard in court today. 
Ontario's Superior Court of Justice is considering U of T's request for an injunction to dismantle the camp today and tomorrow. Tents were set up outside the St. George campus back on May 2nd, with protesters vowing to stay until the school discloses and divests from companies linked to Israel. The school cites numerous reports of harassment and hate speech in the encampment. Demonstrators deny those claims and say the university has not engaged with participants, students or participating students in good faith. Instead of committing to divestment, U of T is actively seeking this court order to give themselves moral cover to call the Toronto police and use its violence and brutality on their own students, faculty and staff. This administration is seeking a court order because we're simply demanding that U of T end its complicity in this genocide. The University of Toronto last month issued a trespass notice against the encampment, but police said they weren't sure they had legal authority to clear the site without a court order. The Toronto District School Board has voted to receive a report on combating hate and racism in schools that is the target of criticism from members of the Jewish community. A large protest was held outside of TDSB headquarters prior to the meeting of trustees last night where Jewish parents, students and faculty called on the board to do more to fight anti-Semitism. Organizers said the combating hate and racism strategy doesn't do enough to address what they call unprecedented levels of hate-motivated incidents incidents against Jewish students. When we're a community as a society in Canada that values diversity and we see a population of Toronto growing and the population of this board shrinking and specifically Jewish students deciding that it's not safe for them in the TDSB, we need to do everything in our power in this board, in this province and in this country to ensure that these schools are safe for all students. A group representing Palestinian and Jewish families welcomed the policy's explicitly naming of anti-Palestinian racism in the strategy, saying it looks forward to collaborating with the TDSB to fight all forms of oppression in schools. Now to a shocking video of a road rage incident involving a knife, and it was all caught on camera. The ordeal left people who live and work nearby shaken. CTV's Heather Wright has more. The video begins with a grey infinity making a U-turn at an intersection in Toronto on Sunday morning. The car stops and two men get out, one of them holding a knife. The man slashes at the person who is recording the video as people are heard yelling. Eventually the man walks away after he's told several times that the police have been called. I'm so pissed off. I got really, really mad. Noor Mahmoud owns the car dealership at the corner where the incident took place. That's not a good for my dealership either. Like a lot of people, they think, like, you know what, that corner is not a great place to shop around for the vehicle. People who live and work in the area, surprised to see what happened here over the weekend. Your reaction when you see that? Well, this is crazy. It's unbelievable. I mean, you just, like, can I never seen these things, especially around this area. Police confirm they are investigating the incident and have arrested 21-year-old Rishab Barua. He has been charged with dangerous operation of a vehicle, possession of a weapon for a dangerous purpose, assault with a weapon, and breach of recognizance. It's really off the rails. Tracy Valancourt is a psychologist and says people usually stop aggressive behavior when they know there could be consequences, which didn't immediately happen in this case. What's interesting is that he's being recorded and it still doesn't de-escalate it. It's not until, like, he keeps reinforcing the point, hey, I, I'm calling the police, hey, you know, um, you're, you're being recorded, that he's like, oh, okay, maybe I'll uh, back off. It's not clear what happened here before the camera started rolling, but police are asking for the public's help in identifying the other man seen in the video. He is wanted as part of this investigation. Heather Wright, CTV News, Toronto. Two years after he was convicted of sexual assault, former Headley frontman Jacob Hogard is asking an appeals court to overturn that conviction. Two years ago, a jury found Hogard guilty of sexually assaulting an Ottawa woman. Arguments are being heard today by a panel of three judges at the Ontario Court of Appeal. And CTV's John Woodward joins us now outside Osgood Hall with the latest. John. Michelle, we heard this morning Hogarth's lawyers argue that there were flaws in that trial and that's one reason it should be overturned. The Crown disagrees and the complainant in the case tells us she'll be watching. 
Jacob Hoggard couldn't be seen at Osgood Hall Tuesday morning, but his lawyers appeared in front of a panel of three judges arguing his conviction for sexual assault in 2022, where he choked, spat on, and repeatedly raped a woman confined in a Toronto hotel room, wasn't fair and should be overturned. At issue, the evidence from Dr. Lori Haskell, who testified at trial as an expert about the reaction of sexual assault victims to trauma. Hogart's lawyers argued the relevance of this evidence, however, assumed the existence of the very traumatic events at issue in the trial, namely the alleged sexual assaults. Unless the jury assumed Hogart was guilty, Dr. Haskell's evidence was irrelevant. It should never have been admitted. But the Crown said the evidence was important to counter misconceptions about the behaviour of sexual assault victims, who do not always leave or report the assault right away to police. The Crown argued Dr. Haskell's evidence was properly admitted. It was relevant not to bolster credibility, but to help the jury assess counterintuitive behaviour that may be misunderstood owing to myths and stereotypes. Without it, there was a risk the complainant's evidence would be unfairly discounted. Once the front man for the band Headley, Hoggard's music career is over. He has said he is making a living as a carpenter in BC. In her victim impact statement, the woman, then a 24-year-old college student, said her life was stolen and shattered beyond recognition. Hoggard was sentenced to five years in prison and is awaiting trial on another sexual assault in northern Ontario, expected in the fall. That sentence was five years, but Hogart has yet to spend a day in jail pending this appeal. The complainant has filed a more than $2 million lawsuit against him and has told CTV News that she uh, does not wish to go through that again, saying if this trial is overturned and, and started again, she doesn't want to be in the witness stand, underscoring the stakes of this appeal. Reporting live, I'm John Woodward. Back to you. Thanks, John. Justin Timberlake is due in court on July 26 to face a misdemeanor count of driving while intoxicated. A police officer says in court documents Timberlake was pulled over in Sag Harbor, New York, for running a stop sign and veering out of his lane. The officer alleges Timberlake's eyes were bloodshot and glassy. He smelled of alcohol, had slowed speech, and was unsteady on his feet. The officer says the pop star did poorly on field sobriety tests and refused a breath test at a police station. Timberlake Timberlake's representatives and lawyer did not requ return requests for comment. He is scheduled to perform Friday and Saturday in Chicago. And with Canada Day approaching, the latest data shows our nation is growing. Stats Canada says the population topped 41 million on April 1st. It grew by 0.6 percent, and that was a gain of over 242,000 people in the first three months of the year. The increase came as Canada welcomed more than 121,000 immigrants in the first quarter. The country also added nearly 132,000 non-permanent residents to the population. In the Gaza Strip, Israeli forces advance deeper into the western part of Rafah today. Residents and Palestinian medics say eight people were killed. Some displaced Palestinians in a Rafah camp are packing up and leaving following Israeli attacks nearby. Meanwhile, the United Nations Human Rights Office says six Israeli attacks in Gaza in the first nine weeks of the war could amount to crimes against humanity. The human rights chief says the requirement to avoid or minimize harm to civilians appears to have been consistently violated in Israel's bombing campaign. Israel accuses the rights office of bias, saying it didn't have full information. Palestinian armed groups are also accused of possible violations of international law in attacks on Israel. The head of NATO will be in Ottawa later this afternoon. Jens Stoltenberg will be hosted by the Prime Minister, who spent time with the Secretary General in the Arctic two years ago. The region is seen as being of increasing importance since Sweden and Finland joined the alliance. Stoltenberg is also scheduled to give a speech tonight at an event hosted by the NATO Association of Canada. A development in North Korea today will surely be discussed when Stoltenberg arrives in Ottawa today. Russia and North Korea have signed a partnership that includes a vow of mutual aid if either country is attacked. The announcement was made following a meeting between Kim Jong-un and Vladimir Putin in Pyongyang. Both countries are facing escalating standoffs with the West. The Allies are concerned over a possible arms arrangement in which Moscow receives munitions for the war in Ukraine. In exchange, North Korea gets economic assistance and technology that could enhance its nuclear weapons and missile program. Authorities in Nevada have no explanation for it. A monolith has been discovered in a remote mountain range. 
Las Vegas police spotted the mirrored rectangular prism sitting more than a kilometer above sea level during a search and rescue mission. They shared a photo of it, hoping someone will come forward with more information. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is now trying to solve the mystery. Similar curious objects have been spotted in California, Utah, Romania, and Wales in the past. Well, they did it. The Edmonton Oilers are still alive in their chase for the Stanley Cup, beating the Panthers 5-3 last night and forcing a Game 6 set for Friday in Edmonton. For more on this, we're joined live by CTV's Scott Hurst. Scott, the dream mm -hmm. is still alive for fans of the Oilers in hopes of ending the Canadian Stanley Cup drought. Give us a recap of last mm -hmm. night's game. Michelle, Oilers fans no doubt riding high today. Maybe waking up a little bit groggy after that big win and exciting win last night. It was a close game for much of it. However, an empty netter by Connor McDavid. Connor McDavid sealed the deal with the just uh, seconds to go, and it was quite an exciting finish as the Oilers, through the first three games of the series, looked like they might get swept in the Stanley Cup Finals, but a big turnaround in Game 4 and then a big win yesterday now to force Game 6 back in Edmonton. So you can bet the team and the fans are riding high as that game is expected, as you mentioned, to go Friday night in Edmonton, it'll be rocking in the Ice District, and you can probably hear the chanting and cheering in Edmonton all the way down in Florida because they're excited. As you said, this could end the drought of getting the Stanley Cup back across the border. It hasn't been won by a Canadian team in more than 30 years, and the Oilers haven't hoisted the cup in 34 years. So lots of excitement on this side of the border. Oilers fans really looking forward to Game 6 to kick off the weekend Friday night and potential Game 7 would then be back in Florida on Monday. Here's more from Oilers head coach Chris Knobloch on what the team's been through all season long to get to this point. With this team, they've seen so much adversity over the past and it's it just elevates their game. I think right now we're playing on house money, no one expected us to be here right now. No one gave us an opportunity, maybe even to be in the Stanley Cup final, uh, let alone give us an opportunity to claw our way back in this series. Um, so we're just having fun. And Michelle, as you might remember, way back to the beginning of the year, the Oilers were really bad, so bad that they even fired their head coach. So the coach that you just saw there, Chris Knobloch, didn't even start the season as the Oilers head coach. And here he is just a few games away and keeping the Oilers alive in the Stanley Cup final. What a story. Can't wait to see how it ends. Can we talk about this dramatic turnaround? You know, the last few games, real different from the first three. What's behind? What has fueled this comeback? It really boils down to, Michelle, the best player in the league, the best player on the planet, and that, of course, is Connor McDavid. He's had an historic two-game run and really a fantastic playoff stretch where he's getting close to records and in a conversation with names like Wayne Gretzky. So anytime you're in those conversations, of course, he's been in that conversation for much of his career, but he's really starting to prove it. With their back against the wall, of course, you know, you can have a really good game in October or in January, but he's had back-to-back -back four point games, and those are games where the Oilers were facing elimination. So they've been able to win two straight after losing the first three, now getting the series back to Edmonton. Momentum maybe in their favor, of course. Florida still has the upper hand, leading this series three games to two. All they need to do is get a few pucks toward the net that might take an odd bounce, get through the goalie, and it could end that way. But uh, you got to think right now the Oilers have really seemed to figure things out, turn things around, and Connor McDavid really leading the charge, not just as captain, but on the ice and, and, and no doubt in the dressing room. He's showing it uh, with uh, you know how many points he's putting up right now, Michelle. It's something to see. CTV Scott Hurst live for us today. Thank you. Thanks a lot. PWHL Toronto forward Natalie Spooner is getting international recognition for her stellar play. Spooner has been named the International Ice Hockey Federation's Female Player of the Year. She led the Professional Women's League with 20 goals and 27 points in its inaugural season. She was also named the league's MVP and top forward. In addition to her PWHL performance, the 33-year-old recorded a goal and four points to help Canada win gold at the 2024 Women's World Championship in New York. 
No real change, still super hot outside. We remain in this multi-day heat event with yet another day into the 30s. So we've learned how to cope hopefully over the last couple of days when it comes to staying cool and beating the heat. If you're down by the water, a little nicer out there, but we have a really moderate wind, so it's not doing too much to help cool things down. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your long range forecast. All right, to the forecast yesterday, today, tomorrow, it seems like it's identical. <laughs> we have to get used to this. I had put on a sweater this morning for the walk to school, and a mom looked at me like, what are you doing? She's like, I yeah. was dying. I think the heat's <laughs> affecting my brain. She's looking at you like you're tripping. Yeah. It is, but it's one of those things. I dress for inside. It's a little cooler inside. The air conditioning, <laughs> right? So, and then yeah. I have two kind of uh, wardrobes for depending on the day. But at least the air is a little less spicy. We are not looking at that uh, air quality statement anymore. It doesn't mean it's not still there. We just don't reach the criteria. So that's kind of the, the differentiator, differentiation there. Uh, temperature wise, it is still outrageously hot. We are in this heat wave. It's not really ending until we get through to the end of the week. So hydration, I cannot stress that enough. It is really important. Weather is brought to you by the Presler Law Firm. Injury lawyers, you don't pay unless they win. A little cloudy out there to get our day started, but overall, it's not terrible, you know? If you have the right stuff to prepare to go outside in this kind of weather, like Colored clothing, lots of hydration, and a hat. A really good idea, especially if you work outdoors. Temperature wise, it's still hot almost everywhere, with the exception of extreme northern Ontario, kind of bordering with Manitoba. But up towards, say, Timmins, they're at 30, feeling like 38. Windsor, 32, feeling like 41. Here in the city, 28, feeling like 37. Into the afternoon, a little more sunshine breaks through the cloud deck, but Either way, it is still really challenging to spend some time outside with that UV index again very high at a 10. 32 this afternoon, feeling like 40, and it's almost the exact same right across the board. Spending time outside, even if it's not a brilliantly sunny day, with a UV index that high, you still have to think about that same level of sun protection. Into this evening, another really warm night, 23, feeling like 29, and it's almost the same, everybody with the exception of Perry Sound by a degree, into the 20s. As we make our way throughout the rest of our day, again, a little cloud cover out there. Uh, low is going to push its way through northern Ontario. We are still just looking at pop-up showers across southern portions of the province, nothing super organized, just those kind of uh, heavy bursts, and then they're gone. Uh, throughout the rest of our afternoon, a little more sunshine around 3, 3.30, so keep that in mind as you're kind of maybe thinking about your commutes home later on today. A pop-up shower potentially as we head in towards about 6.30, but really, if it does come to fruition, they are those quick in and out type of storms. Into our Thursday morning, a little more sunshine out there, maybe some shower activity north of the city into the early afternoon, and again, as we head into the early evening, but overall, it's relatively dry. It's just super hot. As we step in towards the weekend, we are looking at some unsettled weather settling in as we kind of see a bit of a cold front sweep its way through, breaking some of this intense heat. Temperature-wise, as we step into the official start, the astronomical start, the summer solstice, however you want to phrase it, into our Thursday you guessed it, super hot outside into the 30s. Through your Friday, we start to see that break into the evening and then as we step in towards the weekend we are still hot don't get it twisted but it's just not heat warning criteria nathan michelle i'll send things back to you all right thank you jess is the plan to fast track the housing plight in caledon moving a little too fast residents are raising concerns about rapid growth and strong mayor powers that may be too strong ctv's queen's park bureau chief siobhan morris explores the changing landscape in the town of caledon it's a town of wide open spaces, waving fields of grass, an escape from the hustle and bustle of the big city. But Caledon is changing. This is one of 12 parcels of land the mayor of Caledon wants to zone for housing. She controversially used her strong mayor powers to introduce the plan, spanning 5,000 acres that could accommodate 35,000 homes. We need to take a more proactive approach to development. It's a lot of development for Caledon. You're talking over 65,000 doors that we need to build over the next 25 years. In 2021, Caledon was home to almost 77,000 people. By 2051, the population is expected to hit 300,000. Groves hopes to have support of the town's eight councillors when the zoning plan eventually comes to a vote. 
If council is on side, I don't need to use strong mayors. Yeah, this is an estimate. But for some residents, the specter of pressing on with as few as a third of councillors saying yes, please go okay. just a minute, has led to some contentious public meetings. I trusted that you would save Caledon from invasion of developers. The mayor insists developers will have to clear hurdles before being allowed to build, and that could be a decade away at some sites. To say that you're, this is being expedited to save one or two years, is not a justification for um, up turning, upturning this entire process. For Crandall, the fact that a dozen land parcels have been lumped together is a problem. There's no staff report, there's no details, there's nothing coming out about what does this mean. For the surrounding community, environment and services, Groves explains that the town has paid the price for being reactive before. The houses are built, you have no schools, kids are in portables, you have no uh, recreation facilities, and what do we do? We take on debt to build these facilities. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing has expressed concern with some of these developments because they're very close to the proposed route for Highway 413, the Ford government's signature highway project. The region of Peel also has some misgivings, reportedly calling the proposals premature. Town staff is reviewing those concerns for when an updated report goes to council. There's no date for that right now. For those who've been proud to call Caledon home for years, the speed of growth has been hard to accept. Caledon used to be a nice, beautiful place and stuff like that, and now it's just getting too busy. Everybody was friendly, everybody was nice, and now some people don't even look at you. It's aggressive, right? Um, yeah, I'm torn. Worried about what the town and its infrastructure can handle. You want the diversity, you want that change, you want that growth, you want that innovation. It's just finding that fine line. Siobhan Morris, CTV News. The latest study from the Ontario Drug Policy Research Network shows overdose deaths in shelters more than tripled in the first months of the pandemic. And as our health reporter Pauline Chan tells us, the numbers have not come down much since. The study looks at the number, but also the circumstances surrounding the deaths of shelter residents. In the 14 months uh, before the pandemic, there were about 48 opioid-related deaths within conventional shelter settings. So th we do know that deaths do occur within these settings. But what we saw was then in the first 14 months of the pandemic, the number tripled. So we saw over 160 opioid-related deaths within shelters in that period. About three-quarters of people are men. They're typically kind of middle-aged, um, you know, 25 to 45 years of age. That's consistent with what we see across the board with opioid toxicity deaths. We saw a lot of these deaths happening in larger urban centres like Hamilton and Toronto and Ottawa. Co-author of the study, Tara Gome, says one thing that changed early in the pandemic was the drug supply. We knew that there was fentanyl essentially in the entire opioid street supply. But we also saw benzodiazepine presence increase, which meant that the supply was much more sedating for people. And for people experiencing homelessness, that's really important because if you're heavily sedated, you can't keep yourself safe. Gomes says traditionally shelters have had a punitive approach to residents who use drugs, and so many deaths occurred as users hid in stairwells or other out-of-sight places where there was no one to see if they overdosed. We did see some shelters which had supervised consumption sites built into them or peer support workers who might be available to try and help identify and prevent overdoses. So we have seen some advancement. I think having shelters that are connected to treatment and even create safe storage places for people to put their methadone when they are there would be another really beneficial advancement that we could make. Co-author and longtime harm reduction worker Zoe Dodd says the solutions are multi-pronged. You know, what we need to address is the, is the crisis of housing that we're in and also the toxic drug supply. We cannot continue as business as usual as people are dying in this province. Nine people die a day. Pauline Chan, CTV News. A new vending machine in Bramford is providing people with low barrier access to harm reduction supplies. The manager of healthy communities at the Brant County Health Unit says people can get access to items like HIV self-test kits, meth pipes, naloxone and condoms for free. She says the community has been struggling with opioid use and its overall impact. To access the products, people need to create an account which helps track the number of supplies someone takes. The service is part of a three-year pilot program. A new study reveals the benefits of doing resistance training exercises uh, can yield results years later in older adults.
Researchers performed a trial with 369 recently retired and healthy adults between the ages of 64 and 75. The group was assigned one of three exercise programs for a year. The workouts involved lifting weights three times a week, moderate intensity training, and using body weight and resistance bands three times a week. Participants bone and muscle strength uh, were measured two and four years after the trial. The study found resistance training with heavy loads had the best long-term benefits. Meanwhile, the province is advising seniors of soon-to-be-expanded eligibility for a pair of low-income support programs. Starting in August, the Ministry of Health will increase the eligible income level for its seniors' dental care program and its seniors' copayment program for prescription medications. The cutoff will jump from just over $22,000 for single Ontarians aged 65 and up to $25,000. The threshold for couples will go from $37,000 to $41,500. A sequel is in the works for a cult comedy film from the 80s. Yogurt. I am the keeper of a greater magic. The Force? No. The Schwartz. Spaceballs is a parody of Star Wars directed by Mel Brooks. Now Brooks has confirmed he's working on the sequel with Amazon and MGM Studios. Josh Gad is set to star. Spaceballs got a lukewarm reception when it premiered in 1987, but it has since become one of Mel Brooks' most popular movies. The realm's only hope is in a leader strong enough to unite it. And not long after the debut of season two of House of the Dragon, Variety Reports production is officially underway on one of the several other Game of Thrones prequels in the works. A Night of the Seven Kingdoms also takes place before the main series. It's adapted from author George R.R. R. Martin's novella, The Hedge Knight. Still to come, oil is trading at almost a seven week high. Details on why and the rest of your business headlines after the break. Get Toronto's top stories, breaking news alerts, and watch live. Download the CTV News app. Oil prices are up in trading today. Optimism over summer demand is seeing prices trading near a seven-week high. BNM Bloomberg's Andrew Bell has more. Hello there. Oil traded at seven-week highs today, supported by optimism over summer demand. U.S. West Texas Intermediate changed hands at $81.60 U.S. a barrel. Reuters says one factor lifting prices was a Ukrainian drone strike that led to an oil terminal fire at a Russian port. Toronto stocks slipped about one quarter of a percent in morning trading. Royal Bank was slightly lower and CN Rail and CP Kansas City also dipped. U.S. markets were closed for the Juneteenth holiday, which marks the ending of slavery in the U.S. And finally, Japan is the latest nation exasperated by a tide of foreign visitors. Bloomberg says complaints about overcrowding and poor behavior are prompting calls to charge higher prices for foreigners. Locals are annoyed about being crowded out of their favorite attractions or even being unable to squeeze onto the bus to work. That's the latest in business. I'm Andrew Bell of BNN Bloomberg. WestJet has begun cancelling flights as it braces for a possible strike by aircraft maintenance workers as soon as tomorrow. Around 40 flights had been cancelled by this morning, disrupting travel for approximately 6,500 passengers. Nearly 700 WestJet mechanics could walk off the job tomorrow night after serving a strike notice earlier this week. WestJet says it's cancelling and consolidating flights so planes can be parked in a safe and organized manner. It's asking the Canadian Industrial Relations Board to intervene and prevent labour action, a move opposed by the Mechanics Union. Summer officially starts tomorrow, and a new analysis of payment data shows just how vital the high tourism season is to Canadian businesses. Payments firm Monera says in 2023, July and August were the months with the most payments made by international tourists, and a similar trend is expected to repeat this year. Across Canada, August 5th was the day that saw the most international spending taking place, led by visitors coming to Ontario. The U.S. Center for Disease Control announced new measures which will impact Canadians trying to cross the border with their dogs. Some people take their pet for summer vacation or snowbirds traveling south for the winter. But soon, big changes are coming. CTV's Pat Foran has the details. 
Mikey is a miniature golden doodle. He likes to play as well as travel with his owners, Jim and Cindy Novakowski of Curtis. We've gone down to South Carolina a number of times. We like to go in the spring and the fall. And take the dog. Yes, yeah. of course. Oh, yeah. He has a riot down there. On August 1st, the U.S. Center for Disease Control is implementing strict new rules for any dog coming into the U.S. by air, land, or sea. They must appear healthy upon arrival, be at least six months old, have an ISO-compatible microchip, have a CDC dog import form, and a documented vaccine and travel history. Anybody crossing the border uh, starting August 1st or after, if they don't have all this stuff done, their pet's not going through. The Canadian Veterinary Medical Association says the CDC is bringing in the new requirements to protect animals and people. There is some concerns in regards to uh, the movement of disease when it comes to the movement of dogs because the movement of pets has not been very regulated in the past. Anyone planning to take their dog to the U.S. can find more information on the CDC's website, which has an added dog bot feature. There could be a rush of pet owners trying to get the proper documents, and one form that is needed still isn't available yet. If you go to the website, the CDC has said it will be available July 15th, which doesn't give people a lot of time if they have August travel plans. Mikey is three years old and he's already traveled across the border and into the United States twice. But Jim and Cindy say with these new rules, they're not sure if he'll get down there again. The new regulations could cost dog owners hundreds of dollars each. I don't think we're going to be going down there anymore. Um, that's a lot of money to spend. Snowbirds who travel south with their dogs this winter will also have to have the proper documents. Anyone who doesn't will be turned back at the U.S. border. Pat Foran, CTV News. The hot weather we've been seeing over the last few days means electricity use is up across the province as people try to stay cool. Ontario's independent electricity system operator, which manages the electricity grid in Ontario, says megawatt usage is hitting peak levels. It says current electricity supply is adequate to meet demand, but encourages people to reduce their usage, especially during peak times. And speaking of the heat, it's once again affecting GO train commutes across the GTA. Metrolink is warning this afternoon that because of prolonged periods of high heat, it's issuing slow orders across much of the GO train network. That's because rails can soften and expand in the high temperatures. Departure times will be impacted and some trains will be replaced by bus service. The transit agency is advising riders to check their online schedules for all the latest details. TTC workers have ratified their new contract. ATU Local 113 says more than 80% voted in favor of the three-year contract. Terms have not been disclosed, but the union says it has won an industry-leading contract that prioritizes job security, improved benefits, and fair wage increases. The deal was reached just before the strike deadline earlier this month. ATU Local 113 represents more than 11,000 transit workers. The Jays could not hold on for a win against the Red Sox last night. And he lines it to right center field. It's up the alley and all the way to the wall. He took the lead in the second when Ernie Clement drove in two runs. He later crashed into the railing while trying to make a catch, but stayed in the game. The Red Sox scored two runs in the eighth to rally for a 4-3 win. Their second straight over the Jays. They'll wrap up their series tonight. Baseball legend Willie Mays has died. The San Francisco Giants announcing the death of the Say Hey Kid. Mays is considered one of the greatest and most beloved baseball players of all time. He hit more than 600 home runs, totaled more than 3,000 hits, and was known for his spectacular play in the outfield. There's a long His over-the-shoulder catch of a long drive in the 1954 World Series is baseball's most celebrated defensive feat. The center fielder was baseball's oldest living Hall of Famer. He remarkably made 24 All-Star games, won two MVPs in a World Series in 54. Willie Mays was 93 years old. Coming up, a sneak peek at the six films that will make their world premieres at TIFF. That's when we return. The Toronto International Film Festival has unveiled six movies that will make their world premieres in our fair city. Do you need assistance? 
Among the movies debuting at TIFF, DreamWorks Animation's Wild Robot. The animated film is about a robot who finds itself lost in nature and raising a baby goose. It stars Lupita Nyong'o. Other films that will get a premiere at TIFF are Elton John, Never Too Late, an in-depth documentary on the pop legend, and The Life of Chuck, based on the 2020 Stephen King short story of the same name. All right, so it seems like the clouds are trapping in the heat today. A little bit, so it's kind of amplifying how sticky and how humid it feels. We will see some of that cloud cover break up. We'll see a little more blue sky into the afternoon. That just means it gets even hotter. All that heat radiating off, especially the concrete, feels really, really sweltering at times. Now, the good news is there is some relief on the way. We just have to get into the weekend first. We're looking at a generally just cloudy start to our day, but again, that sunshine peaks in just in time this afternoon. We're still sitting at 32 through Windsor, feeling like 41 here in the city, 28, feeling like 37, Ottawa, 31, feeling like 41. We all love the heat in the summertime, but it can be challenging. So check on those vulnerable people. If you're playing sports tonight, you'll need extra water. It's going to stay really hot. All right. Thank you, Jess. And that is CTV News at noon. Remember, you can get Toronto's breaking news all day long on CP24 at our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jessica Smith and all of us here, have a pleasant afternoon. I'm Michelle Dupay. And I'm Nathan Dowd. Be sure to join us later for CTV News at 5 and 6.